Well, we like Thank to you. take you to the front lines of issues here at Scoreboard, and that's why we end the week by returning to the front lines of healthcare with two doctors who face the frustrations of dealing with our system every day. Joining us, Dr. Svetlana Kogan, founder of Doctors at Trump Place Longevity Institute, and Dr. Herbert Pardis. He is CEO, one of the finest hospitals in America, New York Presbyterian Hospital, and we thank both of them for being here today. Good nice to, to see you both. Uh, okay, insurance. Let's start with insurance. You guys, it's the bane of of not only the administration but also of a lot of doctors frankly and those of us on the other side of medicine who just take our our hospital bills and pass them on to the insurance company without looking at the details are part of the problem aren't we absolutely i'm glad you invited both of us today because doctors come in all kinds of economic flavors you know That's we right. have different economic predicaments i represent the solo practitioners in private practice the good doctor here represents uh uh, physicians associated with the hospital and we do have different economic uh, issues concerning us and in order to understand the plight of the patients today we have to understand the plight of the doctors because guess what David they're deeply entwined they are indeed but let me let me just get back to insurance doctor because the Obama administration is not all wrong in pointing to insurance as part of the problem they're not evil villains by any stretch a lot of them are good business people but exactly. for every two doctors in the United States there is now one health insurance employee that's just too much isn't it doctor absolutely what the plans had offered uh, was a streamlining administratively of the uh, plans uh, handling of billing and collection they say and they project quite a bit of savings from that I think we want to take advantage of it and find a way of using that to generate some of the money we need and do dr. Kogan it's a matter of getting the patient and the caregiver whether a doctor or a physical therapist or a surgeon whomever getting the the middlemen out from between them so that if i'm a patient and i'm demanding good health care at the lowest possible cost if i'm directly responsible for taking your bills i'll make sure i get the lowest cost if i pass it on to medicare or medicaid or this new government option this new government bureaucracy exactly. i don't care as much and look at the experience we've had with government run health care systems the medicare and medicaid while the cost of the overhead for the physicians keeps climbing up every year the reimbursement rates for Medicare and Medicaid are declining every year. So, you know, this is a no-go situation. This cannot continue. Dr. Pardis, do you have any doubt in your mind at all that if we have another government bureaucracy involved with health care, as the president is now proposing, this new government-run, government-financed insurance company, that things will become more complicated, not less, more expensive, not cheaper? Well, not necessarily. I think the greater focus should be on what's in the patient's best interest. And one of my concerns is there's a lot of people who are uninsured in this country. One of the most important goals of this uh, reform uh, is one of spreading coverage so more people get health care coverage and get health care when but they need if, it. But if the reason why we're in such trouble in health care in terms of cost right now, and there is a tremendous cost to all the, all the medical coverage that we pay, if one of the main reasons are those middlemen, insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, what good will it do to create another middleman in terms of this public option? That's not the only reason we have economic problems in health care. There's also something called uh, malpractice suits which are enormously Absolutely. expensive. Absolutely, which, which actually the president is taking off the reform. table. I mean, I think in solving the financial problems of health care, what we need is a shared responsibility with multiple people doing it. And that includes people taking care of themselves better. If you look at the cost of obesity and diabetes in this country, they're monumental. I think going for an electronic health care system is the right way. I think we should be incentivizing and paying for prevention. So there's a lot of people who can play a role and work together to try to get health reform. But Dr. Kogan, you have experience not only with bureaucracies here in this country, but you're originally from the old Soviet Union, exactly. right? From Ukraine. You understand how bureaucracies work. They don't make things simpler. They don't make things cheaper. They just add to the bureaucracy, bureaucracy of a situation which we are trying to get rid of now in this state. I have actually read the proposed bill, believe it or not. I spent many a thousand nights. pages? I read the 400 pages of bridge version. Okay. But the main points were there. And the government is going to have a control of who we see as a physician. And we will not have a freedom of choice in choosing our health care facility, our physician, the date for our surgery, the surgeon that will be performing the surgery. This, to me, is unacceptable. We have to deal with malpractice tort reform. You know, we have to deal with reimbursement rates. Um, I would gladly expand the health care coverage to more people. However, 
from what I have learned in the past uh, several months, you know, from the 47 million people that are claimed not to have the health care insurance, the 8.37 million people have income over 75 thousand a year so those people actually choose not to have it mm -hmm. another 8.4 million people have an income between 50 to 75 thousand dollars a year so most likely these people also choose not to have yeah but hold on a second doctor yeah, doctor wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be better to cut a check for all those people all those united states citizens who are uninsured just cut them a check and give them the money to buy insurance rather than creating a new monstrosity like a, a new medicare for everybody as barney frank wants i, I think we got to be careful about assuming that there's any plan yet that's clearly on the table there are different entities in congress going at each other in terms of what they'll actually produce my main concern is that people who either don't have coverage or can't get quality care get it. And whether you say there are a certain number of the uninsured have the resources, there still are a lot of people who are not covered well, not getting the kind of care we, we would like them to get. And I think that's the but most important thing. What's the most thing. efficient way of covering them? What's the most efficient way of covering them? My inclination would provide a, a mechanism by which the uninsured, the self-employed, and people in small business that can get coverage. I would uh, pr protect the private plans and the choice, and I'd have a multi-tiered system. In other words, people would have alternatives. Multi-tiered. I don't know if you guys. I don't know if you guys have read this article in the Atlantic. It just came out a couple of days ago. We had the author on last night. A terrific piece about healthcare. It's a very provocative title. How American healthcare killed my father. But basically, it says it argues that we have to limit the middlemen that are between the patient and the healthcare provider as much as possible because that is what has distorted incentives in our system and the multi-tiered approach is one way to do it. And I also think we have a distorted impression of how people do not have an access to health care. It's simply not true. I'm a physician in the trenches in New York City and I have witnessed many, many illegal immigrants who have no documents getting perfectly fine health care uh, uh, help from from the hospitals for well, the emergency room. Well, to that point, hold York. on a second. Yeah. To that point, it's not just the emergency mm -hmm. room. In your very hospital, doctor, my wife was in a room with a homeless woman who had no insurance whatsoever. They both had the the same magnificent view of the East River that your hospital provides. They both had very similar treatment. The, the doctors came in to treat my wife almost as often as they did to to treat that homeless woman. So it is true that we're not letting people die in the streets. Well, I you know. To have these simple black and whites just doesn't characterize This was in situation. your hospital. Yeah, I'm, 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 my hospital, other hospital, doesn't really matter. The point is there are people, and we try to do it, take care of people no matter what their uh, financial means are, but there are also people who are not getting enough care. There are people who don't have the resources to get the care, and I think that should be the primary intention. And rather than finding anybody to scapegoat, whether it's the bureaucrats or the insurance plans or the drug companies or anybody, I think we should be putting this on a positive foot and say, how the heck do we solve this problem? That's what this article does, by the way. It has very positive, specific ideas about how to change our system. But we've got to move on to the panel, but I want to ask each of you, what's the one thing that needs to be done to make health care more affordable and more available in the United States? I would strip down the administrative complexity of the way uh, health care plans are organized. And get rid of the malpractice payouts that we have right now. Great. I think no, everybody no. except the president. Yeah. The president has said he's not in favor of that. He's taken that off the table. No, he said actually when he went to the AMA, he said well, that he was speaking he, in front of the AMA. You said you, something you different said what in front he of said. I'm else. telling you what he said. As far as I'm concerned, whoever said whatever they said, they should do it. Right. We should have malpractice reform. Gynecologists in the Broward County in Florida are facing a two hundred and eight thousand dollars per year malpractice wow. premium. Pretty soon we're not going to have people to deliver our That's children. That's after tax income, by the Correct. way. You have to make Correct. that much in order to That's pay right. for that incredible insurance cost. Stay with us, Doc. Yeah. We want to bring in our panel, Fox Businesses, Tracy Burns and Toby Smith of Change Wave Research. And Tracy, in order to understand what's been going on, you have to focus first on the town hall meetings. Is the gut instinct of Americans who are protesting at these meetings correct? It does seem to track pretty closely with the polls. Do you think they're on to something? Totally. They're confused. They don't know what's happening. And they're out there speaking their opinions, which I think is phenomenal. I mean, this is the first time in years we've had such an important voice being heard. And look, we've, we've made a difference. Those town hall meetings have made a difference. This thing has been put off, and rightfully so, because it's a pile of nothing. It's not addressing any of these concerns. The fact that malpractice tort reform is not on the table is ludicrous. Why we're not talking about preventative care? 
What, what is it? Well, there is some talk about preventative care, but you're right. There's zero in the 1,000 pages that I went through about tort reform. Toby? Yeah, and let's, you know, there's two big parts of this that are distorted. And the number one is, is that we deliver a benefit to an employee and it's not taxable. Now, if I gave you a, a salary, that would be taxable. If I gave you a dog, that would be taxable. But if I deliver you a benefit, it's not taxable. You know, it goes back to World War II when we had price Well, control. actually, it's it goes back to 1954 when but the wait, Congress the, passed the thing. To right, but, but it started at Kaiser Permanente Shipyard. Mm -hmm. So my point is, is that... But the that, companies paid, small businesses pay tax that, on Tracy, this. I understand that, but Tracy, it completely plain. distorts how we deliver this care because because I don't have a financial uh, uh, skin in the game, number one, and number two, I don't care about it. I'm going to a, a top-line restaurant with a full menu with no prices. And so you're going to have caviar every night. It distorts the others. Well, and then you had Medicare and Medicaid coming to the scene in 1965. For sure. all the good that they have done, there is a tremendous flaw in that system, and they want to use that system as a basis, as a blueprint, yeah. if you will, for this new system. Speaking of preventive care, neither Medicare nor Medicaid are covering the CPT code 97802, which, which is, is the dietary counseling. And this is in the country with 30% obesity, with the diabetes roaming. You know, the sure. Senate Finance mm -hmm. Committee, I think, had a sensible approach, which was to bring in the major constituents, which included the drug companies, device companies, doctors, hospitals, uh, payers, etc., and said, what can you do to help? And most of them, or almost all of them, put something on the table. The hospitals, AHA, American Hospital Association, said we'd be willing to take our $55 billion in cuts. That's where the idea of the administrative simplification came from. It came from the plans itself. The pharmaceutical companies said they would put something in. I think we could spend time banging each other over the head and finding people are evil or else decide... But you know what, Dr. Doctor, this suggestion, the one yeah. suggestion that you both agreed on, tort reform, was not absorbed in this 1,000-page bill that both of us have read. I think that's a major flaw, and I agree with you about that. But, David, you know what, too? In that 40 Seven million that everyone throws around, a huge chunk are illegal right. aliens. Well, let's take care of that problem first. There's just so many ancillary problems that well, they could take care of and, and, where they wouldn't even sure. have to deal with that. But again, let's look at the 50,000 foot level, not making a villain here, just actually dealing with statistics. 20% of Americans are responsible, about 20%, for almost 80% of all the health care consumption I in the United outside. States. 20%. Number one. Number two, about 75% of all health care uh, costs go into the four basic chronic diseases. Um, the idea that we're creating a, a, a thing to take these people off, the, off this uninsured shelf when we're not addressing by far the biggest issue is like somebody's bleeding but in the gas and them oxygen. Don't you all agree that, that what the protesters have done here at these town hall meetings is extend the process by which we look and examine this bill instead of passing it willy-nilly before we've really looked at all the details, including tort reform. I think there's a complex thing which has to be examined, but I just want to come back to what you said, and, and, and that is the idea of personal responsibility Absolutely. in terms of your own health care. It's critical. And if you look at the cost of obesity, diabetes, what we have to do is have an effective program of health literacy starting from grade one in this yes. country so that people really know how to take care of themselves. We've got to leave it at that. But again, thanks to those protesters out there. Otherwise, this thing would have been passed far too soon. Dr. Herbert Pardis, Dr. Svetlana Kogan, thank you very much. We'll hear more from our panel in a moment. Coming up on deck...